Okay, I'd like to call up the uh, panelists. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to introduce myself and welcome you to BRIC. My name is Guy McLeod. I'm the um, director of media education here at BRIC, and I run all of the adult education programs on site, off site. We're in several different libraries around the borough. We run anywhere between 160 to 180 media classes each semester. And we also do uh, public programs like the one you're at tonight. And this type of program is really exciting to me for many reasons. Um, foremost is exposing our community to experts in the field. So a couple of years ago, we were talking uh, about how we can get our community producers to pitch their film and television ideas to people that actually work in the industry. And Aziz said, well, I know some people. Let's, let's put together a panel and uh, invite our community to the stoop so that they can get scared and pitch their ideas in front of an <laughs> audience. That's not typically how these pitches work. Typically, actually, IFP is happening now. Um, typically, you make an appointment. You have much longer than eight minutes. Uh, and you have, uh, um, I think it's like half hour, 45 minutes to really go into depth of your, um, of your show idea. So this is not representative of how pitches typically go. This is more of an educational experience, both for the audience as well as for the person pitching. This is also the first in a series, uh, the pitch series that we have every fall. So um, we start off with a practice your pitch event in uh, September, and then we do a perfect your pitch event as part of Brooklyn Media Maker Weekend, which I hope you all check out our website. And then in November, there's a, an open pitch to Brick TV where it's, it resembles a little bit more of what you would what you would get at a, at a pitch, at a real pitch. So check out our website for more information. I'll now uh, introduce uh, Keisha Cole, who's an Emmy-nominated and New York Press Club award-winning TV producer and editor. Uh, she received... <laughs> uh, she received a Bachelor of Science degree in journalism from Kent State University where she founded and edited an on-campus magazine. Keisha's editing work has been featured in music videos by uh, Talib Kweli and Fat Man Scoop, and a short film by noted filmmakers Malik Saeed and Arthur Jaffa. She has also freelanced with ABC's Good Morning America Now and BET. She is currently su a supervising producer and editor for Brick TV, where she's a series producer on B-Side, Brooklyn Made, Brooklyn is Masquerading as the World with Terrence Nance. She is executive producer on several scripted series that have premiered at noteworthy film festivals, including Tribeca, including They Charge for the Sun by Terrence Nance, Soul Kings, Michael Pinkney, uh, All Hail Beth by Misha Calvert, The Future is Then, Sarah uh, Salov Salvara, Sauce by Dewey Gerard, and the forthcoming Inspector Ike by Matt Grady, and 86 by Alex Spieth. So she's moderating tonight's event, and she'll, she'll start us off. Uh, and then we will start calling um, everyone who signed up to pitch. Uh, you'll have uh, three minutes to pitch, and then five minutes for feedback. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Keisha. Thanks so much, Sky, and thanks everyone for being here, <laughs> including our audience and our esteemed panelists. I get to read all of their, I'm so fanning out on everyone right now, like, I can just say I'm just coming back from IFP and boring my arms tired, but, you know, I've been listening to pitches all day, get to li listen to some more awesome pitches tomorrow and uh, obviously tonight, so welcome to Brick. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Caroline, and excuse me if I mispronounce anything. I'm just kidding. Okay, so Caroline Robinson built a career in, as a marketing expert at companies such as Coca-Cola and Sprint. Most recently, she was executive vice president and chief marketing officer at VH1 and Logo, 
responsible for all marketing, creative, and digital functions. In 2011, Robinson co-founded Coffee Bluff Pictures with filmmaker and advertising executive Deborah Riley Draper. Versailles 73, American Runway Revolution, she's the executive producer of that, is currently being adapted into a feature. Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, she was a producing executive on that, was nominated for a 2017 NAACP Image Award in um, 2017. Robinson stepped out on faith in an effort to bring her creative voice to the forefront as writer, director of the scripted short, The Bill. Robinson's upcoming projects include King X Dirt, executive producer, and um, that's doing a really awesome festival run, and y'all should definitely go see it in Urban World this weekend. And her next scripted short, United in White and Black, where she was writer-director. Robinson has a BBA in marketing from Howard and an MBA in marketing and finance from New York University Stern School of Business. In her most recent short film, Disorder, dealing with mental health issues, just premiered at G, G Cuff in Cleveland, and yeah, as well as Martha's Vineyard. And um, definitely come also see Sauce. We've worked together on that. Is debuting 12:15 on Saturday at Urban World Film Festival. So I hope to see you all there. So next we have the illustrious Michael Pinckney, can I say AKA Boogie, has, for over, has over 15 years experience as an assistant director on films and television series such as Inside Man, Top 5, Broad City, The 25th Hour, 7th Heaven, The Best Man, Law and & Order, and the Academy Award nominated film Precious. Michael made his feature directorial debut with You're Nobody Till Somebody Kills You, a gritty crime thriller executive produced by the one and only Spike Lee and distributed by Lionsgate. He won an award for excellence in media from the Black Men's Film Conference for his HIV film, The Candy Store, and toured the film festival circuit with films from his short film collection, He's directed a variety of digital series from Soul Kings, which was executive produced by, and um, black actresses to the colors of love. In addition to producing the award-winning digital series for Color Boys Redemption, starring Tim Reed, Michael also wrote and directed episodic drama, The Trade, a drama that takes place in the world of sex trafficking and Blue Flame, a drama about all-female fe undercover police in New Jersey. And then you also just recently work on Queen Sugar? You didn't at all? That didn't happen. Okay, something else, something <laughs> else he did. I can't keep track, I'm so sorry. Okay. Lisa. <laughs> Lisa Michelle Payton worked for NYC's PBS station WNET 13, and it was there where she discovered her passion for writing. She later moved to Los Angeles and won acceptance into the prestigious Warner Brothers sitcom writing program. She went on to write for two Warner Brothers hit comedies, The Parenthood and Living Single, starring Queen Latifah. Yes, yes, want to see that reboot. Peyton then worked on um, the writing staffs of Girlfriends, y'all might have heard of that, and uh, the ABC medical drama MDs, and then relocated to New York to help pen the Peabody winning series Ed. Or is that Ed? Is that? Peyton also wrote the first of the two-part series finale for the hit UPN show Half and Half, and was head writer on the series Born to Shine. Driven by her passion to st tell stories that matter, Peyton earned a master's degree from the Columbia University School of Journalism in 2005. She has penned articles for Essence Magazine and works as a writer-producer for Viacom and is a visiting assistant professor at SUNY College at Old Westbury.
Last but certainly not least, Tony Gerber is an Emmy Award-winning writer, producer, and filmmaker. He has written and directed over a dozen documentaries for National Geographic and shot some of the most, in some of the most remote and dangerous regions of the world. And that's not even, oh, that's not even counting Brooklyn, right? <laughs> <laughs> Old Brooklyn. Okay, most recently he directed and executive produced Kingdom of the White Wolf, a three-part natural history series for National Geographic filmed on location in the Canadian High Arctic. He is the producer of the critically acclaimed PGA award-winning film, Jane, about the life and work of Dr. Jane Goodall. His documentary, Explorer Battle for Virunga, about the fight to protect mountain gorillas in the Dominican, sorry, the Democratic Republic of Congo, but for the National Geographic Channel, was a 2017 recipient of the Genesis Award, the Humane Society's top honor for bringing critical animal protection issues to the public. In 2005, Gerber co-founded New York-based production company, Market Roll Films, with two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Lynn Nottage, and they're both our esteemed board members. Thank you. Nadj and Gerber are currently developing a feature film, Everlasting Yay, for Amazon Studios. Gerber is an adjunct professor at the Firestein Graduate School of Cinema at Steiner Studios. So, I feel kind of far away. I'm just gonna sit down and we're gonna do a couple of minutes of Q&A with our panel before we start our pitches. Sorry, we have to share. So I want to go by one by one. I'm going to start with Tony. Can you talk about some of your personal, personal experiences pitching what was the best pitch you ever did, and what was the worst pitch you ever did? Wow. And why were they good and bad, respectively? That's a tough one. Um, I think that um, when a pitch can feel like a conversation, and, um, and you don't feel... Um, <coughs> When, when you don't lose your agency, when you walk into someone's office <clears throat> and they feel like, it feels to you like they have control over your fate, um, you feel like um, you know the rest of your life might be hanging in the balance, depending on how the meeting goes. <clears throat> You've basically given over any kind of agency to that person, and and it, what results is a very unnatural and stressed out conversation, which is no fun for the person on the other side of the desk either. You know, so I think the challenge is to be real and to be relaxed. Um, I can, um, you know, I've, I've pitched, I hate pitching. It's a misery. I've also, um, I've also taken pitches. Um, what I didn't mention is that I was a development exec for a few years early in my career, so I sat on the other side of the desk, which was also a great experience, so it creates empathy, so you understand um, what might be going through the minds of the people who, um, you know, hold the checkbooks. Um, Lynn and I, Lynn Nottage and I recently pitched uh, the film that Keisha mentioned um, to Amazon Studios. Um, we, so we sold it to Amazon Studios, um, but um, the pitching process was very intense and quite scary for me because I work for the most part in nonfiction, as you heard, but my background is fiction and I studied screenwriting and directing, but then, you know, I worked for the next 15 years in documentary, but um, I returned to my fiction roots, and um, Lynn and I had an idea, and we had um, representation uh, that helped us set up meetings in Hollywood, and we got on an airplane uh, right before Thanksgiving, and we flew out there and did something like 10 meetings in two days, and it was ter terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. But what I can tell you is we rehearsed it to within an inch of its life. Um, we had index cards, we practiced, and it was like a performance. And after doing it once or twice, it got easy. Um, the thing that made me the most comfortable in it was um, that I'd created a reel, like a, what's known as a sizzle reel. 
Um, so this was uh, a sizzle reel for a film that has yet to be made, right? So how do you go about doing that? That's something we can talk about. I won't take too much time to do that now. But, but it's, um, uh, you, you, you guys might have heard of uh, mood boards, right? Um, so in advertising, they're called mood boards. Sometimes they're called pitch decks. Um, I created a sizzle reel for this movie as opposed to doing a mood board. So it was in video format. It had music and narration. And, um, and once I hit play, I was able to relax. I was just, whew, you know. Because I didn't, you know, I was I was off and the video was on. So, um, but it was a successful pitch. So that's a great pitch. So my answer to your question, Keisha, I think is that any pitch that's a success is a good pitch, you know. And 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 it's important to remember to breathe, and report important to stay in inside of your body, and not give all your agency and power to the person who you imagine has power over you. That's really important. Thank you so much. Now, I mean, we can, yeah, I love that you guys are clapping, but we might can. <laughs> no, definitely please, everyone silence your cell phones. Um, so Lisa, what, uh, can you talk about, would you say like your first big break was because you have such an impressive uh, resume and I'm yes, just it tells you... my age unfortunately yes yes but um sure I can talk about it so I moved to LA with basically I think I had maybe twenty five hundred dollars that I earned by working a nighttime job in addition to my, a nighttime full-time job in addition to my daytime full-time job um, <clears throat> so I slept on average about four hours a night and I did that for about six months and um, then I just moved to LA and took a temp job. Uh, you know, you can do this when you're young. So for all the young people, you know, you don't have to be fly now. Just go suck it up and be broke and go out and follow your, your dreams. I went out there and I started temping. And all of you should know, if you're writers in here, all the programs that they have out there, the Disney program, the Warner Brothers program, um, the ABC program, um, which is the Disney, the Disney program. Um, <clears throat> the Writers Guild has one as well. So I applied for the Warner Brothers uh, workshop. This was a very long time ago, and the game was a little bit different than it is now, but there was still about a thousand applicants, and they took, um, they took 30 of us, and I was fortunate. Um, back then you could get recommendations. I was recommended as well. Now they don't take recommendations anymore. And so I was in this six week workshop with Warner Brothers um, executives and you had to pitch, you know, an episode of a show that they currently had on air and help develop it while you were there. And so after that process, um, they usually take the top people and they place them on their shows. I did not get chosen to be placed on one of their shows. Um, so I was a little bit bummed, but within, I would say within three months, they had me meeting still with their shows. And um, the first one was they wanted me to pitch for The Parenthood starring uh, Robert Townsend at the time. And so I had to pitch an episode. So I had to come up with a pitch idea um, I'd never pitched before. I was completely terrified. I don't think I slept for like three days at all. Um, seriously, it's like you're just out of your mind. And um, <clears throat> you work on it nonstop. The night before the pitch, I found out that I was gonna be pitching to Robert Townsend. So I almost died. I literally almost died. I was like, what? Like that fact you kept out of this. So it's a very surreal experience as he was saying, when you go in, you kind of have to have a talk with yourself before you go in that, you know, you're just gonna, you're just gonna leave it all out there. Like, you're not gonna leave here with anything less than you came in with, so just go and do your best. And um, it's an outer body experience. But you're a salesperson, basically. That's what I tell people, you're selling something. So you can't go in there and be quiet. You can't go in there and, you know, be unsure. You have to know what you're talking about. And you have to be personable. So went in, I saw Robert Townsend, I sat there, I have no idea about the words that came out of my mouth. I'm not even gonna joke. I, I went in my car and I was like, oh 
my God, I cannot believe that just happened. The next day I got the job. I was like, holy crap, how's this? And um, um, it was a great episode. I got to sit in the room with them as we developed it. Comedy works a little bit different than drama, so there's a comedy room. And it was my first experience in a room. And it was because of the pitch. Pitching is, like you said, it's horrifying experience. It's changed a lot. Now they have what's going I just developed a pitch with someone. We had to create a lookbook. We had to hire a company to come up with a lookbook for the series that shows, um, you know, gives the feel for the show, the mood for the show. You know, it, 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 you know, it gives like potential characters and all this stuff to help you sell the, the show while you're in the pitch. And it's a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, you have to, I would say beyond anything, know your characters inside and out, know your storyline inside out and out, and go in there and just be, be personable. You know, you have, to, you have to sell it. You can't just go in there and just tell the story. You really have to, they have to believe that you have the ability to do this, even if you don't believe it yourself. I love that, that was great. Um, Michael, so what was your, just talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, what was your worst um, pitch experience and what would you have done differently? Like what didn't work for you, is that too, is that too much of a question? <laughs> I'm just thinking about what the worst experience was. Um, and what I could have did differently. And, and one of my worst pitch experiences, I felt like they kind of knew what they didn't want before I got in the room. Um, I was supposed to pitch to one person, and that person was in the meeting, so I pitched to someone else. And they weren't as familiar with what I was pitching them. So basically, you know, they were, I felt like they were waiting for me to finish, you know, before, because they just, they weren't dialed in like the person that really bought into what I wanted to pitch, you know. So somebody bought into it, they knew me, they knew my story, they loved the project, and that's just how networks are. Things happen, things get shuffled, and you find yourself, you know, reintroducing yourself to someone that doesn't really believe in you yet. You know, so that was, you know, a bad pitch experience. And a good one is when you go in and you just have a conversation. They want to know more about you than they want to know about the story because sometimes they buy into the person before they buy into the story. So that, that was a great pitch where I pitched to a development exec, and he was from Queens, and we just talked about New York. But he lived in L.A. for a long time, and we bonded on that, and we're still friends to this day. So it's about relationships, ultimately. Yeah. That is so true. Ultimately about relationships. Go to your networking as a verb, events. You know, do what you have to do to, you know, meet the right people, right? I mean, yeah, that's kind of obvious. So, <laughs> Caroline... What would be your top three to-dos for um, someone aspiring to pitch? You're an awesome, you do great pitches. Like, yeah, that's why we're working with you now. Um, but could you get even like the top two um, to-dos of like, you know, what people should bring to the table when they do Pitch. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing I would say is that you have to actually know who you're pit know who you're pitching to. Um, I think we waste I, I think we waste a lot of time pitching to the wrong people, right? So if you have an idea, um, you have to decide: uh, Am I you know would this work on cable? You know would this work on television? Would this work digitally? Um, you need to know your, uh, know your production companies. When you're watching uh, television and you know, digital content, see what production companies are actually creating that type of work because those should be on your list to, to pitch through to as well. Um, so just look at the, you know, the end card at the beginning. You know, is it Bunham Murray for reality or whoever? But just know. Just know. Um, so one, you're pitching to the wrong person. Two, I always say that it's not about what you want to say, but it's a, about what people need to hear to want to hear more. So a lot of times we want to just throw up our whole story, and we all think our idea is the greatest thing that, that on the planet. We all think we have these brilliant ideas, but you have to know who the person is on the other side, 
and exactly what they're looking for. So you can say, hey, I see that you know, you know, this type of show has become very popular on other platforms or other networks. This doesn't exist on your network and I think there's room for it. And here's how I would propose um, creating that content and how it would live on your network, right? So you have to actually know a little bit about the industry and where the, and where the spaces are and, 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 where you, and where you believe that you can fit. Um, I think um, breaking the ice um, what Mike said is also very, very important in terms of coming into the room and, and not, and you know, a lot of times I'm just like, girl, I love your shoes. Those are cute shoes. Where'd you get those from? And you just kind of, you know, start a conversation. Or if you know someone has a particular hobby, oh, I saw you skiing, but you know, how'd that go? Just, just warm people up. And then the other thing is, is that be prepared to have less time than you think you have. Uh, one of my worst experiences was I had an, an hour to pitch something, and I did it all right. I had a lookbook, I had a sizzle reel, I had a deck. It was we we were tight, and we got in the room, and the executives were like, "You have five minutes," <laughs> and we weren't ready, because in our minds we were talking for an hour. So you have to be ready, right, to summarize in five in five minutes, and then the goal is in those five minutes not to, you're not gonna be able to sell the whole thing in five minutes, but you want them to want to hear more, right? So what is that, what is that line, what is that magical quote, or what is that, what is that one singular story that will, will want those executives to hear more? What I would also say is having worked in television and having been on the other side, because I would sit in the rooms with development executives and go through and have the, and watch them because they would ask, you know, is this a marketable concept? Um, there's nothing that passed through that development room the, where there wasn't some kind of video. So whether it's a sizzle or whether it's a pilot episode or whether even, it's even a casting tape. Um, Cardi B was was greenlit on a casting tape, period, because she's got so much personality and she had a huge, you know, a huge following at the time. So just be prepared to figure out. Uh, if necessary, how to take your, um, your project into some kind of visual form. By the time it gets there, there needs to be some video. Yeah, I totally concur because this is, everybody has phones, everybody saw Tangerine, they filmed that whole thing with the phone, get it together, you know, and, um, and make it look good too. Don't just, it, it's like bad video could be worse than any video. I'd rather see no video than bad video, but on that note, <laughs> let's let the games begin. All right, so Rawa. Thank y'all. Let's start. Let's give her a round of applause, thanks. My name is Rahwa Smuram, and I'm here to pitch my dramedy series called Say It Loud, which I describe as W.E.B. Du Bois meets Sex in a City. Um, I reference Du Bois because the central character is a race scholar, Jamila King. Her name is Jamila King. And she also happens to be a former teen pop star. Um, and I reference Sex in the City because it follows, it, it is an ensemble cast and it follows four 30-somethings in New York navigating friendships and relationships. So the premise, to tell you the premise of the pilot episode, um, starts off with Jamila, the central character, failing to defend her dissertation proposal at NYU. Um, the same day that she fails this dissertation proposal, she gets an offer to do a reunion tour with her former pop group. Um, this is very triggering for Jamila because she left the group over 10 years ago because of how she saw fame tearing apart her family and friends. But now she has this public pressure to return back to the group after news leaks that they might be reconvening as a group. And also she gets pressure from her former manager and father as well as her former best friend and group mate. So she has to take this all in, and the rest, of the, the rest of the episodes in the series revolves around her decision making to decide whether it's better for her to actually come back to music, come back to her first love, to spread her message of um, black cultural esteem, which is what her dissertation is focused on, or to stick to ac academia and lay low, because she's pretty much 
managed to live a very normal life um, since the 12 years that she left the group. So this is very triggering for her, so she's wrestling with this idea of getting back into this public sphere. Um, so this all sounds heavy, but it's actually pretty, um, like I said, it is a dramedy, and it combines my love of like shows like Sex in a City and Insecure, um, but also like it features very smart, intelligent characters. So dialogue is a pretty big part of it. Um, the last thing I will say about it that makes it unique to me is that it's going to be, a, it's based in Brooklyn, and it's going to feature predominantly Caribbean American characters. And I decided to set it that way because I moved to New York 10 years ago, and I was shocked to see just how influential Caribbean culture is here because coming from California and watching television, I would never have known that Brooklyn is so Caribbean. New York is very Caribbean. And even though I'm not Caribbean American, my, a lot of my friends are, and the consulting producer is a Caribbean American writer on this project. So that's my pitch. So we're just going to ask your panelists to chime in. We have five minutes for feedback. Um, first, I would just like to say congratulations. And you have the courage to be the first one up here. And that takes a lot. So and you were, I could understand everything you were saying. And you had your nerves under control, which is fantastic. Um, I think you have set Say It Loud in a very interesting setting. So um, I wanted to hear more about it. <clears throat> My question is, you pitched the pilot to me, the pilot episode to us. Um, I wanted you to pitch this, this series, right? Because it's a series, I assume? Yes. So I wanted, to, I wanted to hear what the conflict is in the show that would sustain it as a series. Um, I wasn't sure, so I wasn't really clear on what the genesis of the show is. Does she end up going back into performing with the girls? And if so, what is the constant conflict that comes up for her that gives this series life? That's what I was missing. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, ditto, congrats for going first. You know, um, the W.E.B. Du Bois meets Sex in the City, that threw me, I mean, it's fascinating, but I stopped and I started, I, I missed everything that you said for the next 30 seconds after that, because I stopped to try to wrap my head around it. You know what I mean? And um, I think it underserves, I don't know what the rest of the panelists think, but to me it underserves the idea because then I started thinking about, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker and W.E.B. Du Bois and, you know what I mean? It took, it, took, it took me out of it. And I think that ultimately the strength of it is your character of Jamila. And I think that you spent, in some ways, the least time on her. Like, I can't really say who she is. I don't see her in my mind. And you had five minutes is what you had, or three minutes? Three minutes you had? Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. I mean, I think that if anything that you want to leave us with it's a sense of who Jamila is, right? And, um, and this concept of what is gonna carry the series, I love this term, narrative motor. You know, the thing that sort of propels a series or propels an hour of television or a half hour of television. It's a thing that sort of makes it move. And that, that's also not clear to me, but, but because it's comedy, right? So, and, and it's character-based comedy, who she is, to me, is the single most important thing. And I don't quite get it yet. I understand what she did professionally and what triggers her, but I don't feel her. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The WEB um, and the yeah, Sex and City thing kind of threw me for a loop too. Um, I felt like it would have been, uh, I love the world. You know, there's not a lot of uh, television, you know, with Caribbean people on it. So I think that was something to focus on. I feel like, you know, her using entertainment um, and whether it's social media or just new tools to kind of teach, you know, the teachings of WEB or just kind of uh, using that to, you know, uh, in her journey, I think that's, that was interesting to me. The fact that she would, you know, she would take these girls on this journey to kind of educate or whatever she wanted to kind of teach in this new form. You know, I thought that was interesting. 
And I feel like you could have kind of used bullet points to just kind of say, you know, television, you know, demographic for Caribbeans is big. It hasn't been tapped in. And just talk about all the pluses that you could use for the show, you know, and they can zero in on that more or less than the, the WEB deep. It just kind of, just kind of, I was thinking, is it a period piece? I was, it confused me. And like, like, and like mm. Tony said, I kind of, you know, it took me a minute to get my bearings about, you know, so it kind of took me out of for, for a minute. So that's not a, you know, just figure out a better log line to kind of get us in immediately. Um, thank, thank you for that. So um, where, where it started to uh, gel for me, you said something about 430, 30 somethings navigating friendships and relationships. And I was like, oh, and then you said the lead character is torn. So when you got into the torn part between being a pop star and academia, then it started to gel, but it took you a long time to get there. So that's the first thing. Uh, second, um, a series Bible. I don't know if you guys know what a series Bible is, but it's basically an outline of what happens in each episode and what happens to the characters. Make sure you do that going in. Even if you don't share the Bible, you might get asked questions about what is this character's journey, what happens, and you have to know. And then also know how many episodes, roughly, are they 30s, are they 60s? Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. All right, Matthew's up next. A round of applause for going, having the courage to go second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my documentary project is called um, American Pal, Conversations with My Father. And it's based on uh, interviews I did with my father uh, over the period of six years and uh, until his death in 1995. Um, and it's, it, it's based on his, his life in Palestine between 1920 and 1948. And uh, one of the reasons why I did it, I think the primary reason, was because I, um, I wanted to get closer to my father. I wasn't that close to him uh, growing up. And, um, and I wanted to change that before he died. Um, I think part of the problem is that he was a foreigner. I mean, you know, I, I, and, and I identified more with my uh, maternal grandfather that was American. Um, and But in addition to that, the person that he was in Palestine was very different than the person that I knew growing up. His life in Palestine was uh, much more exotic, to say the least. Um, so on, on some level, it's also the story of the um, Palestinian diaspora, the Palestinian experience as seen through his life. And, but I don't mean it to be a polemical uh, exercise, and I don't mean it to be a historical exercise. Uh, what I hope to do is to use uh, especially archival footage from the time to illustrate the narrative that I have from my father. Um, and, and to uh, give voice to the Palestinian experience. I know everyone thinks I'm Jewish, especially since I grew up in, in Brooklyn. Um, so to, get, to give a, a few examples of, of what I'm talking about, and, and I, th I think it's important that, uh, I mean really what I'm, I, I'd like to do is sort of bring his life to life. And, and, and by using 
archival material, by using photographs, by using documents, I have documents dating to the 20s, photographs from World War II. Um, and then I also plan to shoot verite footage that'll sort of um, help me retrace his steps while he was there. Uh, um, Michael, I'm gonna stop you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but let's, you have four minutes, so let's leave the four minutes for the feedback. Oh, cool. okay. okay. I didn't realize it went that quick. Yeah. Yep. Anybody want to start? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, it's, so first of all, thank you very much. I, I definitely, uh, uh, I appreciate that. And, and I, think this is a, I think this is a great story. I think, uh, um, again, the thing that jumped out to me around the Palestinian experience was at the end. And I think, so I, I think sometimes you have to start a pitch with a question to pull people into the story. So, you know, it could be something, you know, have you ever wanted to, you know, interview and have, you know, your, you know, a family member tell their story? Well, this is the story of my father. And let me tell you about my father. So kind of set up, create the, common, the kind of the commonality and kind of pull people in and then kind of jump into, j jump into the story. Because there, sto there is a story there. Um, just, just make sure you kind of set it up just to make sure you create that curiosity. Hi. Fantas I think it's great that you want to do a doc on your dad. I think it's fantastic. Um, what I would say is, and, I, and uh, this is less about your actual pitching, but more about the content of what you're pitching. Um, when you're pitching, you want the people who you're pitching to to be able to relate to what you're pitching to. Even if it's about Palestine and I'm a girl from Brooklyn and you're pitching to me, whatever that thing is that's gonna connect me to your father and his story, and I can see myself in that, that's what you gotta pitch. Okay, because you've got to sell me why people beyond Palestinians and you would be interested in seeing this documentary. So that's how your pitch has to be framed. What is it that you want people to walk away with from learning this, the, hearing these stories from your dad? Like, what is it? So documentaries are just, it's just long form news. So you're trying to give someone well, true documentaries are long form news. You're trying to convey some information or share some information with your viewing public that will change them or affect them or make them better in some kind of way. So what is that in the story about your dad? What do you learn that you feel that people need to know? And that should be the focus of your pitch. Um, I, did, I didn't hear a story. You know, and uh, let's say you had, you had three minutes. If you guys are in a situation where you have three minutes, that's, that's also known as the elevator pitch, right? That's how you, that's how you get in the door. You know, let's, the, the proverbial tale is you happen to be in the elevator with uh, Steven Spielberg and, you know, and uh, he likes a flower you're wearing on your lapel and that's a nice flower. You know, you have an opportunity. Tell him a story about the flower, which happens to be a pitch for a film. No. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't hear a story. And you probably said 10 times, my father, right? And that was, I don't know you, and I don't know your father. And now having heard the pitch, I, I, I still don't know you or your father, right? So uh, to me, you didn't use your time as effectively as you could have. Um, if you had saved the information that this man you were making a film about was your father, and that was the very last thing you said, then I would have been like, wow. You know, if you said, you know, Abraham so-and-so, I mean, you know, I don't know, I'm making it up, um, was born, da, 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 he did this, he saw that, he was, you know, he was a zealot character, he was there when these great historical events happened, and he, you know, and, but he never knew his child, you know, it was, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what it would, what would be, and then at the end he said, and this was my father. See, what happens for me when you say I'm, you know, interviewing my father, I start thinking, well, why isn't it a home movie? You know, it's a great personal project, and you should do it, because you'll learn a lot doing it. But why, why, do we, why does the world need it? You haven't answered that question, you know? Mm. Um, uh, this film could be amazing or it could be not amazing. We, we don't know enough 
You know, um, you, you didn't tell us a story, and I would encourage you that that's what you need to do, is tell a story that engages, right? Okay. Um, calling Al. Is Al in, in the audience? No? Um, all right, so first on wait list, Elise. Shen Yu, come on up. Hi, uh, my name is Shen Yu Pan. Uh, I'm introducing my documentary, Here at Home. Uh, this is a story about immigrants and uh, also the relationship between food, music, and the meaning of home. And uh, so the, the artists in my films, they are from Syria, Lebanon, and Japan, and they are members of Yoyoma's Silk Road Ensemble. And uh, please. I was planning to move back to the old city of Damascus. The Syrian revolution started in March 2011. I realized that I can no longer play it. It's unthinkable to play while less than a kilometer away, they're like jets bombing. How disappointing is it that this current administration has what many would just call outright a Muslim travel ban? As a traveling musician, you get exposed to lots of different people from different backgrounds. But you play the ambassador's hat regardless if you like that or not. I live in New York. I travel so much that I really feel kind of part of a global community. And so it's very easy for me to forget that the majority of the people in the world don't. The biggest challenge for me when I moved to New York was 9-11. I was worried speaking in Arabic in the streets. People are afraid of people who don't look like them. What is a culture? What is home? Taste is the sense that's connected to memory. Tofu, shiitake, daikon, gyoza, and fried up by powder, thank you. Mwah. I have to home cook. It's a way for me to carry on like a memory that my dad left for me. Time, zata, time, and sesame. My mother's side's last name is Breadmaker. Grandmother was telling me this story about her mother, Armenian refugees in Syria, how Syrians welcomed us in 1915. I think it will be amazing one day to, to have a, a collaboration between how the food looks like, how you can take that image and transform it to music. Well, so let's do it. Let's do it. Cheers, guys. Cheers. <laughs> you mentioned about the chef. You said chef is the size. Whoever is making the food. Uh -huh. It's gonna be one of, one of us, I think. Is this a documentary or a docu-series? It's a documentary feature. Documentary feature. Yes. Um, I love, you know, Sizzle's great. You know, I kind of get the picture of what it is. I even think that it, it has, you know, a possibility of a, a longer life. You know, it's kind of Travel Channel, Food Network, kind of like Anthony Bourdain. It's kind of like amazing oh, to hear that. music and yeah. food. It's like what connects us. So I yeah. definitely think that, you know, there's a, maybe a, a four-part, six-part mm -hmm. docu-series. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a documentary, sometimes you can monetize that a lot easier than sure. raising money to do a doc. So, mm -hmm. you know, I always kind of like to live in both spaces if possible because that, that always helps. Um, so thank you for that. And, and I agree with everything that Mike said. The other thing I would ask is, so what I love about documentaries is that you, you start with a hypothesis and then as you start to capture footage from the story, that hypothesis may move a little bit. The real, the real story happens after you've captured everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, my question to you would be, where, where's the tension in the story? 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what the what the tension is, and and why, and sort of why I should kind of follow this journey. Um, can they answer questions? Yeah. We yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my intention for this is that like, um, we, uh, as immigrants here, like uh, sometimes we don't find, I mean, sometimes we just like uh, get lost. Like once we come in here, like a few years later, like we forgot, I mean, we get in forget who we are. And I, I try to use this, uh, uh, this, this project to uh, sort of like encourage people to look for their identity, like really believe in ourselves. Okay. Right? Because yeah. that's it. That's important. Yeah. As part of explaining why this whole thing matters. I see. Okay. Thank you. This, this is the second time I've heard the pitch. I knew I recognized you <laughs> yes. from a Brooklyn Film Festival. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm still a little confused, I okay. have to say. Yeah. I don't know what the story is. I mean, I think it's, you know, as, as Michael said, th these are beautiful elements. Mm -hmm. um, the pitch is, is provocative and, and um, it feels like it's going to be something magical. But I couldn't, if someone just said, what, what was that pitch just about? What was that about? Um, I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really wouldn't. Um, if it's a feature, right? I mean, if it's, if it's a short somehow, and it's, you said to, to encourage people to claim their identities. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I get that. And that's beautiful, but that's not a story. Mm -hmm. And how, how does that go on for 90 minutes? Do you know what I'm saying? You don't have to answer, because okay. I know you want to. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, if, if there's time, I suppose it's all right. But um, um, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes with a, a, a sizzle or a trailer, you're not in the room to explain it, you know. And even if you send two, three pages of something written in form of an explanation, people are lazy and they usually don't read. They just want to watch something. Um, you know, text on, you, you need, that, that needs to explain, first of all, that it's a feature film, feature documentary. We need to know... Um, that it's about, I mean, if it is in fact about those four musicians who at the end are talking about let's do something, what is it they're going to do? I have no freaking idea. And it seems to involve animation and it seems to be driving toward a performance. I mean, if you just spelled it out, four musicians from very different cultures who all love food come together to create uh, an extraordinary one-of-a-kind performance that celebrates distinct cultures, but celebrates what they have in common, which is the fact that music and food bring them back to the home they can no longer return to. Bam, that's a pitch. Yes. Now, now I get it, if that's what it is, right? But yes. that, if, if that's right, I don't even know if that's what it is, but if that's what it is, mm -hmm. say it. You know, because that's important and beautiful. I agree with everything he just said. I was reluctant to pick up the mic because though there are a lot of very interesting and provocative uh, clips there, I wasn't sure of what the narrative was. I wasn't sure what you were trying to say. And so it's hard for me to you know, give you a note or a direction. I think you, if it is what he said, then that's what we need to see up there. Start with that, mm -hmm. that, that last clip you might want to push it a little bit further to the front or something that, that we understand what's happening from the very beginning. All right, Letitia. Are you ready, Letitia? You're not ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, who's next, Elise? Uh, Who? Candace. Candace? All right. Come on up. Hi. Are there any homeowners on the panel? Any, any homeowners on the panel? Well, imagine if you're a homeowner, if you close your eyes for a moment and imagine it's winter and law enforcement comes to your door and throws you and your family out onto the street and it's snowing and they throw your furniture out onto the street and you come to find out that there was an illegal foreclosure taking place um, and you have nowhere to go. That is the storyline for what's called the Robocon, 
which has to do with the big banks on Wall Street who created a shell corporation um, and with no oversight from local or state authorities, they have been conducting illegal foreclosures and some sketchy foreclosures that have been challenged from one corner of the country to the other. Um, and they have uh, been um, getting away with this for uh, several decades, is my understanding. This is a short documentary, and it's a massive subject, so I could only do so much uh, work on it because I have a full-time job, but um, it is, um, uh, you know, um, it centers around uh, Sandra Hines, who's a Detroit homeowner and activist who went down to uh, Washington, D.C. to give Congress a piece of her mind and to ask, what, you know, why, uh, you know, what she, she's, she doesn't know what's going on. Uh, and there is an expert panel, this is based on a congressional hearing in front of the House Judiciary Committee. And there's an expert panel. It's a three, I built it into a three act story structure. There's her testimony, the expert witnesses, and then there's a conclusion and an outcome. Okay, and so basically, um, just backtracking a little bit, in 2016 I completed a short called Go Quietly, which had to do with my own, it was a, um, an autobiographical short that had to do with my own experience with Wells Fargo and institutionalized racism in the mortgage industry. And then in 2019 I completed the Robocon, which is um, this story that I'm describing to you now. And so, um, what else can I tell you? It is in a, a few festivals, and I've been calling members of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, working with some festival directors who have um, uh, contacts with nonprofit organizations. Uh, it's, um, there is a trailer for the Robocon. I don't know if it's here, but uh, it's, I cut a trailer, and uh, it tells the story in less than one minute. Um, and so I could take any questions you may have. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So you're saying that the short is basically, it shows the hearing that takes place? It does. Okay. So is it just the hearing, or do you interject it with any kind of personal story yes. that goes along with it? And yes. How do you do that? Is yes. it intercut, or who is yeah. it? Can you tell me about that story sure. that you're telling? Absolutely. Um, yes, there is some, I integrated some B-roll. Um, I'm actually going to do an interview with the man who, who exposed the robo-signing scandal. Okay, do you tell else? anybody's story in there? Anybody's I tell my story as a, I tell her story as the central character. Okay. Her name is Sandra Hines. And then I get away from the, C-SPAN footage that I pulled and I get into my story um, to, to give it a little more humanity and to get away from that archival footage um, and, and just change it up. It's, you could say, a work in progress. Um, it's kind of fodder for a feature because it's such a massive subject that it's, only six, it's just a 16-minute film. 16, or 16. 16 one six. Starting with a question, I think was very strong because I was immediately I was immediately drawn in. Um, it feels very dense to me. It does not feel like a documentary short at all. Like it feels like a, either a feature or some yeah. sort of docu series. Yeah. So yeah. I would I would just you know um, ask that you think about that. Yeah. And I think that there are a lot of um, potential uh, angles to explore, mm -hmm. whether it's the you know the home ownership or. Like you said, in, you know, racism or politics. It, it it just feels very dense. Mm -hmm. So I personally would would be interested in hear in hearing more about that. So congratulations. I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think again. I think a documentary short is that that just feels way too short to me. I thought your open was great, and everyone felt that, right? I mean. Yeah. We were all eaten out of the palm of her hand. That was powerful. That's, that's a, a very effective way to begin a pitch. And you could have taken us anywhere after that. And um, it took maybe a beat too long before we knew what it was, because you could have gone TV series, feature film, document. I mean, it could have been anything, right? And then it was too, you know, maybe 90 seconds in, you said it's a documentary short. 
and then maybe a minute and a half, two minutes later, we learn that you've already made the film and it's in festivals, right? Which feels a little anticlimactic because I thought we we're talking about work that people are dreaming up and not work that's already done in some sense. And so, um, and if you were using this pitch time to talk about how to turn this short into a feature, right, which is interesting, and using the short kind of as a calling card for the feature, um, maybe you should have pitched the feature, you know, and then you could follow up with the short as a kind of calling card. Mm. Um, I, I, I like to use the term uh, eat, your eat your vegetables television. You know what that means? It means it's good for you, so you better eat your vegetables. Um, I personally um, don't, don't think of documentaries. This is my bias as long-form news. Um, uh, I, th I, I like to think that what I make and what I, what I teach when I teach is um, a cinematic nonfiction, I like to call it. So they're movies, but they happen to be in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, 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 um, they follow the same rules and the same um, aesthetics and craft and, and, and technique. You know, we talk about suspense, we talk about slow reveal, we talk about uh, surprise. All of these elements can be in documentaries, right? And they can also be beautiful, filmed beautifully, right? Mm -hmm. And they should be, I believe. Yeah. Um, so this does feel to me like, like journalism, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, not, not specifically my cup of tea, because you could also do that in, in, in print. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I guess if I'm gonna critique the pitch and give you feedback, I don't know why it's a film and why it's not uh, an editorial, you know, mm. in a newspaper. Could you have done it as an editorial? And that's a good place to begin. Like, why does it have to be a film, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, that was my thing. I wasn't sure what you were pitching, especially, and then I heard that you, you completed it. It was a short, you know, so it's kind of like, why are you pitching it? You know, unless you, like Tony said, you're pitching to raise money for the feature and you kind of can show us the trailer and stuff like that. So. Yeah, proof of, it, it's... Acquisition pitch, where you're actually getting it, trying to get it acquired. Right. I haven't thought of That's that, but I... You're trying to sell it. Yeah, yeah it's... Oh. More of a, I, I see it as a proof of concept, a calling card for a feature film. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Good. Thank you. All right, Derek. I'm gonna be totally honest. I'm not even sure if I'm doing this right, but I'm gonna try. Um, this show is called. Uh, uh, yeah, you can put. You can. That's the biggest images can go. All right. Well. Okay. Fine. Uh, this show is called Now Laters. Uh, the log line is: Five young ladies navigate through life, creating mayhem and mischief along the way as the political climate of the world changes. Here's the synopsis. <laughs> This show I created and developed called Now Laters. Uh, season one consists of eight episodes of a five season arc. The first few stories of the drama, dark comedy, will primarily be character studies while slowly bleeding into a crazy plot. I'd love to talk about the five female characters that drives the story. Harlow, uh, the angsty leader who happens to be a lesbian. Summer, the naive computer genius that just is such a sweet person. Maeve, the thrill seeker, the wild child, Lemon, the hippie, weed-smoking, transgender woman, and Alex, the smart, ambitious, but socially awkward, stiff, and rigid one. But before we get to these characters, we need to talk about the world that they live in, and why at this moment, every action that they take shapes this world. And to do, what, and to do that, we need to understand the zeitgeist. Now, the zeitgeist of the world has always been split up into three sections of a pie, a phenomenon I do not understand, but always as a voyeur of this constant change. You may ask, what are you talking about? Sounds like word dribble. Simple. Every 10 years, this theme of humanity makes a tight focus on particular cultural interests. I'll start where modern media has a lot of its recording, recorded information. From 1945 to 1955, we welded metal with Rosie the Riveter. We can do it under the zeitgeist of gender equality. Uh, 
You get a brand new washing machine from 1955 to 1965, we sold appliances to housewives under the zeitgeist of family values. And in 1965 to 1975, we had big afros and dashikis under the zeitgeist of racial harmony. Now the names of these three zeitgeists have always been code names for what they really stand for. Gender equality, women, feminism, sexual freedom, family values, white dudes, national economic growth, imperialism, racial harmony, black people, acceptance of different ethnicities and or religions, or economic materialism. Now that wasn't just the past, this still continues to this day from 1975 to say 1985, we were burning bras, gender equality volume two. From 1985 to 1995, Reaganomics was still in full effect, family values volume two. From 1995 to 2005, Puff Daddy, hip hop, rappers were all you've seen on MTV, matter of fact, the world, racial harmony volume two. Now here's the kicker. From 2005 to 2015, Paris Hilton, her dog, Britney Spears shaving her head, sex tapes, the Kardashians, the several housewives of a bunch of different states, reality shows, leading up to Me Too, was considered gender equality, volume three. But like I said, the zeitgeist changes every 10 years, and with the election of, well, this current president, we should be full swing of family values tour season three, right about now. But for some reason, gender equality is fighting back, not ready to relinquish its throne to whatever family values tyrannical practices have in store, a fight for our very souls, while racial harmony looks on the side wondering what to make of this. Now, this is not a story about good or evil, but when faced with the constant trying times, where do we stand? The winners, the losers, the many in between, gray, gray areas all around, what is our choice? This is the world of our five characters, a world where either a malevolent or benevolent force is guiding our fearsome five to a new reality, a world we are not sure of, the world of the now-laters. That's that. I said it really fast. I don't even know if you understood, heard what I wow. said. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Whew. Just breathe, just breathe. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, you know, that was a lot. Um, but it was, it, I loved how you kind of really started everything with all the elements. You know, the, a great title. I love now, ladies. I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, you know, the great log line, synopsis. You kind of set it up where, you know, you compartmentalize it so we can kind of somewhat follow it because it is a lot of information to take in on the pitch and you don't want to overwhelm your audience. So I was able to kind of follow and I, I'm really interested in the world. And did you mention what, what it is? Is it a film? Is it a TV show? I wasn't yes, sure. I mentioned it was a uh, eight, eight, episode, uh, ep eight episodes of a five season series. Comedy, drama. Uh, it's a dark, uh, a dark uh, dramedy. I said dark comedy. comedy. Okay, okay, great. Is it just me? I didn't know what was going on. I, you were talking about the, the zeitgeist, oh, really the bad. broad, but I'm like, um, what is this? I mean, I don't know. I'll stop. No, no, please. Uh, I want to understand so I can explain it. Um, when I, well, usually when I talk about the zeitgeist, I mention how in every generation in the 10 years, people tend to, there's a winner and a loser. So if it's, say, 1980 and it's Reaganomics and you're a little kid and you're watching Ronald Reagan, you see all these rich Republicans. But at the end of that whole situation, they have a scapegoat. There's uh, Colonel Oliver North being, you know, charged with every other white man's crime for what, he's the scapegoat for all their stuff at the end of that. If you look at hip hop, there's all these rappers boasting money, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of it, you see Wesley Snipes going to jail for tax evasion. There was plenty of other guys for tax evasion. So when a zeitgeist happen, in any zeitgeist, whether it be current or past, there's always winners and losers, and it's the choices we make that really define who we are. So yeah, I can be like, oh, I hate this president, or I hate that, or I love this, and I love that, but I have to make a firm decision because we're all going through this craziness together. And some of us become more radical for it, and some of us doesn't. So that's what this show's about. I think yeah. you should be doing a live performance. <laughs> with, listen, with, with, with PowerPoint and, and live music. And that's your medium, you know. A um, couple things. You spent more time talking about your theory of culture than you did about the show. So I still don't, I, I get your theory of culture. I don't know what the show is. 
Got right. It. And also, I would say, read if you memorize that, if you memorize that, and you sp you made eye contact with us, I would have been captivated. I don't. I still wouldn't have known what it was about, but I would have been captivated. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But the fact that all all of your love went to your screen oh, I was left me cold. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I you built a world that you know very well. Clearly, um, I was a little lost on how that translates to episodic television. Uh, you, you gave us these characters and you know their brief descriptions, um, but I still don't know what's going on in the show. Like I don't know how this translates, not even to a series, even the pilot episode, I don't know what that looks like. And I think you have to be able to convey that as part of your pitch. Yeah, I think um, um, I agree with everything. I, I, I was, I was following, hanging on to your every word. First of all, so you, you present very well, and you're obviously very passionate about it, and you're very knowledgeable. And that's a, that's a good thing, because passion goes a long, long way. Um, I guess my question to you, when, when you think about genres you know, in, in episodic television, or just genres in general, they're, all, they're gonna recycle. Right, so you know, you know, friend ensemble. There's always room for another one. The question is, what is the unique spin? What, what is the you know, what is the backdrop? Why are these characters different, better, or special? And then help us understand why we should care. Okay. Too bad it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have Antoine Perlman. All right, so look, I didn't even know you can do video. So just left, I, I do got video, but I'm gonna try to read what I got. So, and all your shoes are dope. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So that show called The Reef is the name of my show. It's a half hour narrative comedy. All right. A Kim uh, see, I'm already messing up, All right? A comically misunderstood voice actor finds, his, uh, finds himself juggling family and his career while trying to recapture his former on-camera glory. That's what the show's about. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the black Charlie Brown. That's A Reef. <laughs> that show called Arif is a series about an exaggerated, fictionalized version of voice actor Arif S. Kenshin. As a young man, Arif claimed the fame was uh, from goals from acting in film and television such as House Party and Sparks uh, to Saved by the Bell. All right. uh, the, future's pro the future was promising uh, until a critical decision uh, derails his path to stardom. Now, 20 years later, Reef is a family man working as a Los Angeles voice actor, taking on characters in both animation and video games such as Princess Smoochie. Set off by a run-in with a former co-star turned big-time actor, the series revolves around the Reef's struggles to revive his on-camera TV and film career. In the pursuit to become a real actor, Reef uh, continues to work the surreal world of voice acting, um, a profession filled with comedic robbery over roles, a looming voice actor strike, uh, fans who think they can do his job throughout the series. Oh, wait, that's the next thing. Throughout the series, Arif <laughs> is living a married with children's life with his witty wife, Tan Kinchin, who struggles with multiple sclerosis. I'm saying it wrong, multiple sclerosis. Uh, he confides in Kim Brooks, a sister-like figure and fellow voice actor. He seeks gigs from Charles Lee, a weirdly elusive agent who Harif himself is not sure he ever even met in person. And then he also shares a podcast with Mike and Julian, the worst best friends ever. Most episodes have guest stars, voices such as voice actors, actors, YouTube, to YouTubers, comedians, athletes, and fictionalized ver who play fictionalized versions of themselves. Between the crazy characters and odd situations, Arif's life is always interesting. Will he succeed? Like, or will, like Charlie Brown, will he have that football success snatched away at the last moment? Okay, that was the best I could do. <laughs>
Like I said, y'all was awesome, man. I'm just. <laughs> well, you're awesome, and you have to. I'll just start by saying, never let them see you sweat. Yeah. And just what Tony said before is, you gotta like practice and memorize because once you start looking at your phone, you're just gonna lose people on that alone. And I'm gonna drop the mic. I love the black Charlie Brown line. Thank you. That had me. That's great. Thank yeah, you. and you have uh, you have a lovely baritone. So I'm imagining you probably do some voice acting or voice work yourself. Uh, uh, interview celebrities and stuff. Yeah. Actually, you used to work for Logo, so that's why. I, so, yeah. I actually really like your idea. Um, uh, because there's a, there is a story there. I see this guy who is who has a goal, which is to become an actor, a successful actor again. He was sidelined with family. He's been doing voice work to try to pay the bills, but his goal is to get back in front of the camera. I understand that, that's great. I wanna know, I can see what that pilot episode looks like. I can, I can put that story together. So I think you are onto something and it's actually an interesting world to me. I like the voice character things, I think, he could be playing some really interesting characters every episode that I think um, could be very entertaining, but the, the thing stays the same every episode. He's gonna be chasing that thing, that move, that carrot that constantly moves, yes. no matter how close he gets to it. So there is a story idea there. I think what you have to work on is your pitch. Oh, yeah. I think <laughs> that you have to try your best to leave the nerves at the door. Be confident in what, so if you want me to, to buy this, I have to be confident that you're confident that you can do it. So you have to just try, I know it's hard, because I get nervous all the time, <laughs> trust me. But you have to, if anything, you have to work on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I think you have great presence. Um, so I, I, I actually, even though I, I agree with you, I actually think, like you had, you, we were listening, yeah. and we were following what you were saying, so, which I think is fantastic. Um, Practice in front of the mirror. Uh, tape yourself on your phone and, and watch yourself cause, because sometimes you don't even know what your face is doing, but you have to see, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but you have yeah. to see. So I, think, so I think practice for you will be, will be really important. But I, is, is this animated or no? This is live action, I'm sorry. This is live yeah, action, yeah, yeah. okay. That's yeah. why, yeah, the black child Charlie Brown, I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I went to animation. Okay, awesome. I like the concept um, and you know, we don't, we don't know that you don't have it together, so don't, don't let us know, because that's the only way we know, because you mentioned it. But I really love the concept. It's, it's a great comedic formula. You know, um, comedians, you know, it has a lot of places where it can go, you know, half hour comedy. Um, I think maybe just tightening it up a little bit and just making, streamlining the pitch a little more, so it's not, it, it's a lot, but it can, I feel like it could be more streamlined. And you can just tell us what the story is, who the characters are, and maybe some of the quirky things that they get into and get in and get out. You know, sometimes people can talk themselves out of a deal because they kind of went too, went too far. You know, just, just get in that sweet spot and just, just have them ask questions, you know, um, as opposed to giving, giving, give them enough so they want to ask questions because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we'll talk too long, you know, and they either sold or, or, or you know, they, they kind of check out, you know, so, but I love the concept. All right, cool. I mean, if I got a tiny bit of time, I do have a video, but it's up to you guys. I, I, I want to say it's less than a minute. I mean, less than two minutes. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> oh, they call it the lights and everything? Huh? And I'll interject in another thing too. You got it? Yes. Okay. I'll stop. Why don't we just rewind and uh, see uh, where we're at? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Arif S. Kinchin. Where my haters, where my haters, I don't got him. I'm not famous, no. Like he's a, he's a, he lives in the, in the That's a good word. neighborhood That's where there's. Violence. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's in a violent. He just came, and yeah. there was like some gang members around. Do, do you want me to read it more black? 
Yes. What's a black voice? Is this a black voice? Is that a black voice? Is this a black voice? I mean, What's sounds the like perception. <laughs> right, right. I said well, Wesley Snipes. You said it first. Yeah. Black. Very Wesley Snipes. Oh, oh. Black? Not that black. Yeah. But that's uh, Wesley Snipes. Yeah, a little. Doesn't have to be Wesley Snipes. <clears throat> that seems like that. That's very that's black. That's aggressive. That's, a, that's yeah. very aggressive, yeah. He doesn't pay his taxes. Right. He wanted me to read, I like vanilla ice cream more crooked. Like, like, like. Okay, Arthur. Hi. Ready? Uh, hi, my name is Arthur Vinci, and I'm the creator of the fiction web series Three Trembling Cities. And tonight I'll be here to pitch season two. Um, Three Trembling Cities is an intimate portrait of the inner lives and daily struggles of the immigrants who make New York City's heart tremble with hope. The show is anchored around two characters, Urmi and Babakar, and the show follows them and their circle of friends as they juggle jobs, relationships, family expectations, and their own dreams. Uh, Urmi is a graduate student from India. In season one, she's stuck on her dissertation, uh, dealing with a long distance marriage and uh, suffering uh, from the departure of her best friend and roommate. Um, her and her friends are dealing with issues of isolation, of identity and belonging. Babakar is from Senegal, and he's working two jobs so he can send money back home to his family and also start up his jewelry making business. He's also undocumented, and he lives in constant fear of being deported. Uh, he hasn't been back to see his family in 15 years. Uh, him and his circle of friends are dealing with issues of survival. So season one came out in October 2016, it's 90 minutes long, 10 episodes, uh, about 10 minutes each. Um, and it's been to uh, 30 festivals across the globe. Uh, it's picked up seven awards to date. It's distributed on multiple platforms. We've also teamed up with various groups and organizations to present it as part of panel discussions on immigrant rights and immigration policy. Uh, what we wanna do in season two is move forward three years to see where our characters are at. Uh, Urmi has now graduated and she's working as an underpaid and overworked adjunct, uh, but she's trying desperately to find a permanent job um, in a very crowded academic field before the clock runs out on her status. And she's also unfortunately dealing with a divorce. Babakar's jewelry making business is finally turning a corner, but he is still living in fear, even more so now, of being deported. Uh, we also want to introduce some new characters who will bring their own uh, histories and perspectives into the mix. Um, you know, our goal from the very beginning has been to present at least a small piece of the rich tapestry that is immigrant life in New York City and to show that there is not just one immigrant story but many. Uh, it is also vitally important right now that we have positive and meaningful depictions of immigrant life on screen and we are humbled and honored to be a part of that. Thank you. Great pitch. Thank you. Um, and I loved how it went from season one to season two with, with raising the stakes, you know, developing, you know, their lives and really opening up to bring in new characters and just seeing them kind of grow. I think that really shows that you know how to build an arc where, where the characters can grow and how they can, you know, how the series can go to a season three and a season four and a season five. So that was a great demonstration of that for me. Thank you. From, from, from your lips to, you know, <laughs> somebody's ears. <laughs> uh, I, thought it was I thought it was fantastic. Um, first of all, I think the subject is incredibly topical. Thank you. And so relevant right now. I love how you established the success of season one uh, and all the festivals it's been to and the awards. So there, so there is a pl there's a place for it and and showed how the, the the their journeys evolve in season 2 so i thought it was great and you practiced ah, so you. i thought it was fantastic <laughs> why three trembling cities where does the title oh. come from uh, the, the the title comes from um, a part of the essay by eb white uh, called here is new york okay. um, basically he said new york is 
really three cities. Okay. Um, I, I could give you the whole quote, but it's kind of long. But, okay. Um, and, and it's more, uh, you know, when I was, I was searching for a title for a long time, and there was something just so evocative about that. Um, and when I wrote it, this was before the election, um, you know, you could already feel the, the, the tension, the trembling in the city and in the country around the issue of, of immigrant life and immigration. Um, and I thought it just kind of got that, got to the heart of, and also being in New York, you know, it's like a constant, you're constantly on the edge of something. Mm -hmm. right? So I, okay. I don't know, it just seemed to make emotional sense. I don't nice. know. <laughs> and you say we and us, do you have a writing partner or are you just talking about your production team or who are you referring to? Uh, yeah, so I, I wrote and directed the first season, um, but I have three producers, uh, one of whom is here. Okay. Deborah Adig, this was. The other two are, are, weren't able to make it. And then uh, ideally in season two, depending on what kind of budget we were able to acquire, I would love to open it up to more writers, more directors, and okay. then take a, take a, you know, okay. a, a sort of more traditional showrunner seat. So I, I really like it. So I just want to say that I, I really like the concept. Um, I would say since you already did a season one and this is a pitch for season two, I would really want you to um, really flesh out for me the, the arcs, the character okay. arcs. Thank How, you. Like, so I could see you know, the journey, <clears throat> excuse me, the journey that these characters would go on um, and how different it would be from season one. Okay, great, thanks. I, I got confused when you said, um, it, it almost seemed like you were um, you're telling a joke when you said, um, you know, I'm here to pitch uh, a series called Three Moving Sid Traveling Cities, uh, but I'm here to talk about season two. Mm. You know, I thought, okay. well, Thank I don't you. even know what season one is, and you're talking <laughs> about season two. It felt, felt almost like, a, like you were, like you were um, being um, ironic or something, you know? Okay. Um, but but then you went on and then we understood that you've already created it and it's already been broadcast and, or it's streaming. Um, so somehow the way you, may, maybe for purposes of, this is the point that was made earlier about know who your audience is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not sure the fact that season one already exists, you should have led with, I mean, you should have just led with story it okay. seems to me, Great. right? And then okay. the mechanics and what we say, when we say um, brass tacks or inside baseball or in the weeds, you know, these kinds of expressions of what it is and how many parts and what it's won, don't waste your time with that. I mean, no one, no one here is gonna write you a check, right? No, I, I, right, I mean, we're here for advice, right? For feedback. Um, so, so um, <clears throat> and, and what we want and what all human beings want is story. That's, story is what, makes us different from you know, other creatures on the planet, right? It's this thing that we trade in, that we, we share, and uh, it's a kind of currency, and it's what connects us and makes us feel alive, right? And um, so that's much more interesting to me than how many awards it's won, and, and the season one, season two, how many parts, this and that. Just tell me a story, man. And, then, and if the story's beautiful and I love it, then I want to know, you know, where, where can I see this, you know? Right, cool. so, yeah. Thank you. I think that's great feedback, and I think this, you're a great example of this is an elevator pitch. This is, you know, it's rehearsed, but it's not overly rehearsed because there's that thin line, and you just came across as really confident and just knowing what you were talking about, and everything was so succinct, and that's what people need to be like, just how this, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll take a quick five-minute break, if that's okay with everyone, and then we'll reconvene at 8.35. We are going to continue with a few more pitches before we wrap up for the evening. Um, this has been a really awesome night so far, and uh, I hope you're enjoying yourself. Uh, I'd like to call up our next person pitching, Nancy. Can, can we so, get quiet in the back, please? We have three more. Please, quiet in the back. Quiet in the back. And then the front. Okay. And on the side. All right. Okay, Nancy, you ready? 
So what happens when a massive nuclear weapons plant closes down in your neighborhood? Rocky Flats, my feature film, is the story of one community's fight to bring to light the toxic legacy of the Cold War in their backyards. We follow five characters um, on the front lines of the recent controversy at Rocky Flats, which was the most notoriously mismanaged nuclear weapons plant in US history. And on that site it, right now is the brand new Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, which was just opened. Um, and so essentially, <laughs> um, Col basically this story, Colorado residents are rising up in protest. Um, they're struggling with these new levels of government misinformation and deception. Um, and I'd like to play a clip to show an intro of one of these characters. At the center of the site is a nuclear superfund site. You know, I was hoping that the more research I do on it, the calmer I would get. But instead, the opposite happens. The more you learn about Rocky Flats, the more difficult it is to believe that this is considered normal. I don't think you have to know nuclear science to understand that something is wrong out there. I'm Michelle Gabriloff Parrish. I'm the mother of three and a wife that lives in Superior, Colorado. And I ended up founding Candela's Glows once I realized how close we live to Rocky Flats and all of the other issues that surround that area. If this is your first action around Rocky Flats, can I see hands up? When I started out, I had had a few people tell me, be careful, you're going to piss off some really powerful and really rich people in the area. This is where the contamination used to come from Rocky Flats. Now Stanley Lake is known for being lined with plutonium. Rocky Flats is a former nuclear weapons manufacturing site where they made the plutonium triggers for the Cold War. Well, the part of the bomb they were making at Rocky Flats is the dangerous part, and that it's basically a nuclear super fun site at its core. The story of Rocky Flats doesn't go well into the container of an idea of what they think of as this area. You know, this area, people are coming here to be outdoors. I'm not just gonna be silent about something that I know is happening within visual distance of my house. We're now well into production and about to release this urgent story in the world. Oh, sorry. Um, so we're now well into production and about to release this urgent story into the world. Is, I, I, I think I is it a, it, it feels like it's hybrid, right? So these are actors? No, no it's, it's a, a documentary. Doc okay, okay. So it's funny, I watched it thinking, because you said I'm gonna introduce you to a character. Uh, yeah, I, it's funny. You, she pit, did she pitch it like it was fiction? Yeah. Okay, but it was interesting going in and thinking, wow, this is sort of a hybrid fiction form that's pretending to be a documentary. That's what I, that's what I thought I was watching, and it was very effective. <laughs> And I thought you even invented Rocky Flats. I thought, wow. If only, if only I did. <laughs> In your pitch, it sounded, I thought you were building this world. I thought it was a fictitious world. Um, and so when I started watching it, I was a little bit like confused for a second, but then I, I liked what I saw. I think you have, um, I mean, it's, I understand what's going on. I understand what the issue is at hand. Um, it seems like you have compelling characters to help tell the story. Um, so yeah, I think it's good. I too thought it was uh, scripted. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow, this is gonna be like Stranger Things, you know, but, but once I started watching the, the doc, it was amazing, you know, it, was, it definitely pulled me in is definitely something that I want to learn more about, and I'm, I can't wait to see the doc when it's done. Yeah, isn't that interesting? We all thought the same thing. Yeah, so, uh, j you know, the setup, isn't, the setup is important. I also thought, I, I also thought it was great, and, but I would ask, if you're already in production, 
what are you what are you looking for right now? Uh, financing. That's the okay. So yeah. if you're looking for fi finishing funds yes. or financing, just be very clear on exactly you know what you are what you are looking for. Are you looking? Are you at a network asking them to help you finish the project? Are you, like just what do you want? Yeah. Congratulations. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, so, so now that I understand what it is, um, is, is there a scoop? Is there something singular? Is there, is there a way in which this has never been told? Are you, are you doing fresh investigative journalism here? In a way, yes, somewhat, somewhat. It's, it's, it's a definitely a mixture. It's definitely a hybrid of journalism um, and just sort of portraiture, I guess. So it's kind of like you see sort of the lives of these activists and various folks in the movement, um, but you know it's with a sort of eye at seeing what's going on with um, the health department, the federal government, and all these other agencies and why they aren't doing anything. So it's almost like an Erwin Brockovich kind yeah. of story. And I think that's, that's also, yeah, you know, it also very important, like who are they fighting against and why is there lack of action or inactivity on it. Like, who are they fighting? Yeah, that's, yeah, it's the short time. Yeah. <laughs> didn't have oh time, God. you know, but yeah. That's no, that's crucial because I want it, you want to see the stakes and you know, obviously when you see hazmat, you see, but you are really, it's almost like your main characters just seem so happy. Like, I mean, it was just in the interview, it was just something about her smile that was like a little bit off-putting to me where you kind of just want to see like more how dire the situation mm -hmm. might be. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It was just more like I would have probably just covered that with a little bit of B-roll, but I thought it was really strong. Thank it's, you. It's still one more minute. I can ask another question. Yeah. Um, so we get that whatever's happening is bad, so, yeah. so we got that. So is it affecting people? Is it affecting animals? Is who people. Like Animals, dogs are dying okay. of cancer from the dog so park. So I think the, if yeah. you, in your, in your um, sizzle, if you could follow a person or have us see that, because right now it's the activists, right, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's a person, even if you tell just a little bit of their story and we understand how this is affecting their lives, that's what hooks people in. Okay, not necessarily activists. The activists are good to have in there, but they, they're not, they shouldn't be doing your storytelling. The story should be about the people or the things that it affects. Well, the story is really of the activism itself. So it's okay. a, that's the story is of what they're fighting and, you know. Okay, so it's their journey. That, so you're following the activists I'm following, in their journey? To, she's, okay. I've followed Michelle for some okay. time and there's other folks that, it's just, it's, it's a complicated thing I get because it, there's I get like it, these scientist just, activists and yeah, then, yeah. I get it though, but I still, I think it will help if we can see who the victim is. Oh, well, she, I mean, they kind of all are. Oh, That's they the thing the, okay. is they have, uh, you know, um, oh, sorry, I'm out of time. Okay, yeah, no, I, sorry, I understand. Yeah. Thyroid issues. <laughs> uh, Cynthia Turner, one of I just like to say thank you guys for coming here and just showing us um, what we're doing wrong, what we're not doing wrong, and um, helping us get out there and let the world know that we are who we are. And um, I'd like to congratulate all the prior um, pictures. My story is based on love, lust, lies, and the murder of a 31-year-old son and how a woman got through psychological and emotional grave disorder one to commit suicide and homicide after the murder of her 31-year-old son, while being in a relationship, having heartbreak and heartache at the same time. She traveled out of the state many, many times, trying to reconcile her marriage, which went on a nil. However, she persevered through it all. The 31-year-old son was a wonderful, kind, inspirational young man who touched many, many lives. He was a father of three, and his youngest daughter witnessed his murder. 
The mother was actually contacted on social media by the perpetrator. He didn't know that he was talking to the mother of the man he just murdered. So documents was presented to the judicial system where she now became a witness in her own son's murder trial. Three years later, in another state, sitting in a courtroom, hearing experiences, hearing episodes, hearing what took place, seeing pictures of her son, of her son's, um, I would say mutilated body from the surgical um, incisions that had to take place in order to save his life. It happened July 30, 2011. He died to July 31st, 2011. Four hours after the incident took place, he was stabbed in his chest with a 14-inch butcher knife, which pierced his heart and his liver. While sitting in the courtroom, waiting to be called to testify against the statements that she received, um, all types of thoughts went through her mind. Homicide, murder, anything that was negative to get him to feel what I was feeling, it crossed my mind. But on the other side, I realized that through prayer, faith, hope, right? You can get through anything. And I know that God has turned my tragedy into triumph. So the moral of the story is to let people know that no matter what we go through, because everybody has some type of hurt and pain in their lives, but no matter what we go through, we can get through it. I remember not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, not being able to function, not being able to want to get out of my bed, not trusting anybody, about to lose my job, couldn't pay my bills, losing weight, hair falling out, and I was a total mess. I had hated the whole world, and I thought God had forgot about me. I thought, why my son? He was a good kid. He was a college graduate. He was a wonderful father. I don't think a mother could have asked for a better son. He started a union with Applebee's. He went from a busboy to a chef, a top chef. Then he moved two years later to another state that I won't mention because it is actually a true story. He moved to another state, brought a house. He trusted the people that actually killed him. My six-year-old granddaughter witnessed the murder, and she was also a witness in her father's murder trial. So the moral of the story is that a woman can beat the odds, right? Anyone can beat the odds of tragedies when it happened to us. So why, don't say, why me? Don't say, why not me? I had to ask the question, God, what do you want me to see in this, and who do you want me to help? Because I was so selfish and self-centered, I just only thought about, why me? So my story is about how can I help somebody else get through? Because people have committed suicide pertaining to these experiences. So I just want the world to know that we can get through. I wrote the first book because the man that left me who I thought I loved and I thought loved me, um, six months after I buried my son and I wrote a book and it's called Loving Him and Losing Me. And this is the Thank first you. Book. This is the first book. The second book Thank I wrote was pertaining to my son's murder trial, and it's called My Grieving Heart, and he is my son, and I just want him to live on. So I want it to be a documentary, maybe even a short film, so people can know that we can live through tragedies and we can help somebody else, even in our worst nightmares. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's see if we can have some, Thanks so much for sharing that. It's, I'm very moved and very touched, and... I... I was hoping three quarters of the way in your pitch, I, I was hoping that turn wouldn't come where you started to say I. And when you started to say I, then it was just, it just broke my heart. Um, thank you for sharing something so personal. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, it has to be very hard for you to be up there and mm -hmm. to talk about this incident. So I applaud your courage. Thank you. I really do. And you took, your tragedy and your pain and you turned it into something that to help other people that you're holding in your hand right Absolutely. there. And you know, that's what 
being a creative person and storytelling, I promise you, storytelling came out of pain somehow, somewhere, the first storyteller. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can take some time and figure out how you want to tell that story and what medium, because it's going to be important on how we give you okay. direction and notes, okay. whether you decide to do a documentary or if you decide to do a, a film or whatever it is, it's going to be different. Okay. So you have to kind of decide in your mind and your spirit which way you want to go. But thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, yes, I echo uh, what Lisa just said. So first of all, um, let me tell you what you did that was very cool. During the break, you came up and introduced yourselves to all of us and said, thank you. That was wonderful. And thank that you. was, and so you broke the ice. Thank you. Right, by, do, by doing that. So I thought that was, I thought that was absolutely amazing. You have something very amazing that you waited until the end to talk about, and it is the fact you already wrote something. Mm -hmm. You already have a book. You got two books. Three. Or, th okay. <laughs> three books. <laughs> you got three books. Yes. So what you have, potentially, is an adaptation. Mm -hmm. So you have an opportunity to pitch adapting what you've written into some sort of you know, feature or short or episodic series. So I would encourage you to, co to come at it from that perspective because you've already written about it. So just think about it through that filter. Okay. You have such a beautiful spirit. Uh, Thank you. And, um, you know, it's a tragic story. You know, I commend you for sharing with us. And you already, like, like she said, you already have an intellectual property which is extremely valuable. Um, and, you know, for me, creating is also about purpose and giving back and yes. sharing my story. So I definitely understand that, you know, we, we all have a testimony and, you know, we should talk after this because we're going to make something happen, you know. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was, it was very, very powerful when you went from third person to first person, you know, and, um, but, um, there was a moment when you were still telling it like you were talking about somebody else that your vo voice cracked and you sort of um, had a pause, right? And it was really clear that um, this was your story. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that, that turn that you made to then owning it and ch shifting to first person. And I wasn't sure how much you had planned that or it just happened naturally, but it was deeply powerful, right? And, and in some sense, I feel like what we just experienced was, was um, performance is not the right word because that means that it was sort of cynically preformed pre and, and planned, but there was something really honest and raw and emotional about it that moved us all, right? Um, that in some sense almost needs to be captured. Thank you. you know, I know we're talking about translation of this experience you had um, into some other form, but the, what we just experienced was deep and powerful and beautiful and raw. Thank you. Right? And I, after it was over, I thought, ooh, I wish I was shooting that, man. That was, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. I think anyone who sees that would have felt it. And the fact that it began yeah. as a pitch, right? And then it became a confession and, a, and, a, and a, um, an unburdening was really like a deep and powerful um, transition somehow. So I, I don't know. I mean, if you're looking for like next steps, I would say work with somebody and tell your story on camera and let's see what happens. I'm calling you. Know. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think we have time for one more. So Erskine, can you come on up? And then we'll finish out the night. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Al. Everybody was wonderful. And I'd like to thank uh, Keisha and everyone, the whole panel. They were very gracious to everyone, um, which is, which is a, a beautiful thing because people can feel very nervous. So I'm gonna, my name is Erskine Spence. I'm going to get into my pitch. Um, I'm going to have him set it up properly. Um, my pitch, you can go to the beginning. Try to go to the beginning of the uh, actual... Okay, pause it. So my, my um, pitch is for a television show. It's a dark comedy. Um, it has, it's kind of fantasy surrealism. Uh, it's uh, about a young couple moving into a building 
and they just got married in Brooklyn, and they meet a mysterious superintendent that drive them crazy, and they meet other eccentric tenants. So I'm just going to give you a little, a little, you know, a couple of minutes of the, uh, the pilot. You must be the new tenants to the building. Hey, yeah, how are you? Welcome. Yeah. My name is Delroy Jenkins. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, we're we moving the last of stuff in here. Yeah, we just moved in. Well, I hope you're here a long, long, long time. We do too. It's a shame what happens to the last tenants. <laughs> what, what happened to the last tenants? Oh. It's a strange Weird. dude. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's just get this stuff I could be anyone I want. Hello, glad you dropped in. Have a seat. Enjoy the scenery. I don't remember. This can't be happening. It's happening. You're in the garden. How did we get here? I don't remember going down the stairs. <sighs> Pinch me. Any minute I'm going to wake up. We're dreaming, right? We're uh -huh. dreaming right now, right? What uh -huh. the hell? You're wide awake, I assure you. You see the doors in this building? They're controlled by me. I've been here for a long, long time. <laughs> Once in a while, the building needs to be fed. Okay, Pops. I think you're losing it. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Maybe you need to take your meds. How do you explain entering the garden? You're here because I summoned you. Yeah, he has a point there, but you know what? We, we are, we're leaving. <laughs> you look thirsty from your travels. Could you care for some tea? Uh, okay, Danny, I'm really freaking out right now. Uh, yeah. No need. Let me explain. This building, it was built on a portal. Mostly off of energy. It feeds off mostly humans. Now, you can either be a caretaker. You can even be the food. It's your choice. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's, let's just get us things to leave. We can get new things. Let's just leave. All right. Okay. Wait. What? What if we can't leave? We gotta try. All right. So let's just take the stairs. Okay. The that looks like us talking to Mr. Jenkins this morning. I know it's creepy. Let's get out of here. Yes. <gasps> You can't leave. It won't let you. So that yeah, that was just a little bit of first floor. Um, so it's a, it's a episodic. It's a seven episodes. And the uh, the thing that's interesting about the show that I'm trying to push is that each each week you meet a different tenant. Control that he's he's the main person in the show as well as Beth and Danny. Um, and each week you meet a different tenant that's eccentric and they have something to offer, and that they're going on a journey where they're trying to get out of the building, and they can't get out of the building. So the, the thing that keeps the show together, it's not just about them being trapped in the building. It's an older building that's actually in between two newer buildings. So it's about progress and, and something being old and them you know, finding this, this deal in this building. And it's, it pretty much gives the concept of old Brooklyn and new Brooklyn. And uh, that's okay. about it. Yes. Okay, thanks. Let's get some comments. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, good job in getting that shot. I think that, you know, that takes a lot of courage uh, and effort. It's not easy, so I commend you, definitely. Um, you described it as a dark comedy. Should it, it feels like it should be a horror film um, or a horror series. It feels like the tone is off for me. Well, it's, it's, it's I, I would say more so, uh, more surreal, surrealism more than, than, I guess, dark. It's a comedy, but it, it has a surreal feel to it. So you never know what to expect. It's not necessarily horror. There are some horror elements, but not, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far saying. It's, so it's more like suspense, you're saying? Yeah. Okay. So dark comedy, it is not. So, um, so dark comedy is twisted funny. Is it funny? I, I, that was the same yeah, the tone is, like, I wasn't sure about the tone. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh. So dark comedy is still inherently satirical or funny in some kind of way. Okay. And I wasn't, 
I didn't get that that's what I was supposed to feel when I was watching it. I was getting that I was supposed to be nervous or tense or, you know, something that suspense or a horror film would give you. Gotcha. So I don't know if I'm wrong. I understand. Um, well, the, as, it, as it progresses, you, you see there's an there's a, a, a element of eccentricity to this character, and they start to try to understand who he is as, he's, as they're trying to figure out who they are as well. So um, that was my interpretation of, of the dark comedy part of it. Um, any more questions? So it kind of reminded me of like Black Mirror. It's kind of dark comedy. Um, did you shoot? This is a pipe. Is this the pilot? Uh, it's, it, it was shot as a short film, but I decided to make it into a series. Um, okay. So it came off as a pilot, but yes. Okay. I would I would kind of cut this into more of a sizzle, mm -hmm. you know, if you, so you can so it can be a little stronger, you okay. know, shorter. Because um, I like the concept, but I think it kind of got a little a little muddy. You know, sometimes you have to you can't tow the fence. You got to pick. You got to choose. Is it a are you gonna go there dark comedy, really kind of thriller ish, or are you gonna you know, be more satirical, but I kind of feel like you, it kind of, you, you didn't really kind of choose, you okay. know, and I think a shorter sizzle will kind of help, you know, kind of sell the idea, but I, I like the concept, but, you know, I wouldn't show this in the picture just because they, you know, you can say I didn't have a lot of money, you know, I didn't have the budget, but they don't really care about, you know, what you don't have. They want it to look like what they want it to look like, gotcha. you know, gotcha. so you don't want a concept to be great and then you show them a sizzle that they kind of don't really like and they pass on the project. Did you did you cut it as well? Uh, no, no. For, you work with an editor. Yeah. Um, I I can look look at it with you afterwards. There's a couple of screen direction things that'd be very easy to fix mm -hmm. that I don't think serve it. You know what I mean? Okay. Someone's looking left, then you cut to them. They're looking right. That kind of thing. So axis, yeah. which side of the axis you're on? It's very very easy to fix. Little technical thing. Okay. But I I would feel remiss not to say anything. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I would say not to not to get back on the genre again, but mm -hmm. I'm still not 100% clear because um, you said said something about surreal. Uh, yeah, well, and, that the, and from a genre perspective, there's kind of that does I don't it, so it, it, you do need to you know is it comedic is a comedic thriller or is it, it I, I guess my question is, is there any comedy does comedy play a role in this at all? Yeah, it does play it plays, okay. plays a role. I mean. Uh, 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 Initially, it should have a. It, it, I wanted it to have a feel like Kirby Enthusiasm, where it's the the comedy. It's, it's just happening, and it feels like it's being like it's you know something should click right after that and into another scene as something awkward happens. So um, I thank you though. I, I appreciate the the advice because now I know how to fix the holes in in the in the in the story. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I, I we could go on and on. Um, and. And thank you for everybody for getting up here, having the courage to, you know, um, expose and share with us your awesome ideas. We wanted to just end by, let's say, a minute each. If you guys wanted to just give some general feedback um, that you've noticed from these awesome eight pitches that we just heard, like if you could just surmise like what you think people could work on and what some of the strengths were? I, I was going to say something for, to Erskine um, um, that it feels like you, you loved making this and, and it's beautiful and I don't, I, you know, I, f I feel like the feedback we're giving you is like how do you turn this into a Hollywood pitch? Whereas this may already just have a life online and be lovely and be fine. I thought that it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that the production values were, you know, ready for prime time necessarily, to be perfectly frank. But it was made, made from a place of joy and love and, and, uh, and a real genuine play. And the fact that you're in it was beautiful. So I think that, you know, um, not, not all work has to be uh, on, on cable TV and be syndicated. You know, um, there can be, and, 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 and that's the role of this place in many ways, right? Um, that uh, if you love making work, and you love making work with a community of actors and a community of technicians, make the work, you know? I know you need money, and it's not, it's not free to shoot things, 
But if by hook and by crook you figure out how to make stuff, you know, as Kesha said, make, make things on your iPhone, you know, tangerine is shot on an iPhone. Um, holding stuff up to some sort of like polished commercial standard isn't always the way to go. It may, maybe it's what you want, I don't, I don't know. And then you can get that sort of feedback. But I think that the, there's something that you, in terms of the terms of, I mean, I know folks, folks are quibbling with, with your pitch and use of the term dark comedy, and I, I agree with that. But I think that, I think you fulfilled everything you set out to do in that, in terms of what I'm seeing. And I think it was enjoyable to watch. You know, um, I, don't, I don't know how the audience felt, but um, you know, and does it have distribution now? Is it streaming somewhere? It's on a site, it's on YouTube, something? Yeah, but you could, you know, you could, you could put it, if you have a YouTube page, it, it could live there and people would, people would enjoy it. I mean, it's, just keep making work, you know? Don't wait for permission. That, that's what I want, that's the last thing I wanna say. All you guys, don't wait for permission. Figure out how to do it, right? And you'll eventually come into your own voice. You know, Spike in the early days, and Michael could talk to this probably better than me, he wasn't waiting for permission. He just he started making work, right? And then people thought, he's got something, right? Just keep making work. That's, that's what I think is really important. Can we go down the line and just, thanks. So I just, again, want to repeat how impressive it is that people get up here in front of all of these people and share their work. I have never, ever, ever, ever done that. And I, I'm terrified in a room with two or three people. So I just want to just say how impressed I am that you got up here and you completed that task. I think that's outstanding. Everybody's at a different place with their work as, you know, as expected. But my one thing that I would say is just continue having courage, continue believing in yourself that you have a space in this creative world, um, that what you have to say is important. And if you, if you hold to those three values, I think that um, you can succeed. I don't think that there are people, okay, so let me just say this story really quickly. When I got my first job on Living Single, Living Single was my first staff job. I like almost threw up when they called me and told me I got the job. I am not lying. I called my sister and said, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Why did they give me this job? <laughs> like seriously, I said that. Because I was like, I have no idea what I am doing. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna make a fool out of myself. I went into the room and I sat down and I realized there was a bunch of people like me there that thought the same thing, that they were gonna make a fool out of themselves. And they were from staff writer all the way up to like co-executive producer. Everybody's trying to figure it out. There's nobody has like the magic, you know, the magic pill to success. So everybody is a work in progress, even the successful ones. So if you know that, then you should just continue to be inspired. Yeah, to echo that, you know, it's, I always say it's process over perfection, you know, and and it's about being authentic. You know, if you believe in a story, that's all that matters. You know, people will, you know, once you build it, they'll come. And it's about figuring out what your intention is. If you want to just do it on YouTube or if you want to pitch it to a, a larger platform, it's up to you, it's your story. Whatever you decide to do with it, just figure out what that intention is and then move in respect to that. But just kind of continue to create. You know, if this is what you want to do, you know, it's, there's a lot of us out here that are, you know, th this is what, you know, this is important to us, so create and eventually you, you're going to get there. You know, just, it's just about staying in the process and not, you know, looking at anybody else's journey. Everybody's journey, everybody's race is different. So just stay the course. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, it was incredible to get up here in front of us and all these people is incredibly brave. So thank you to everyone that, that got up and pitched because... I mean, I don't know if I would have been able to do that a, f a few years ago. So um, thank you very much for being vulnerable and authentic and transparent. Um, so the, the first project that I, that I shot, I'd, I'd never shot anything before in my life. Um, but I saw Quentin Tarantino speak, and, who, and he did not go to film school. And he said the best way to learn how to make a movie is to make a movie. And just make your mistake, make your mistakes along the way. And I made huge mistakes, and I spent th I spent three times more than I thought I would. But the point is, I I made a I made a film, 
right? And, and, I, and I kept going. So don't let all of these, you know, you should do this and don't forget this. Don't, I, I hope you're not leaving with fear, right? About, you know, perfection and if it's not exactly right, I'm, that's not what it is. Um, to everyone's point, just keep creating and, and make your shit and you, will, and you will learn along the way. So thank you. Yeah, and we hope to see you at more of these brick events because like Sky said, we have a lot more to come. And um, what was my, um, my last little nugget? Um, I think you're awesome. Like uh, acting class is not a bad thing because sometimes it's all about like the performative aspect of it. And once you get that down, you know, then you just knock one thing one after the next and you know follow us all online follow these people online see ifp is popping you know just see what the city has to offer in terms of like resources and go for it and i'd also like to say that this is really the realm the time of the multi-hyphenates and i just had dinner with this awesome woman and she was an actor she is a director she's um a ca you know she's a casting director and, you know, utilize all of your skill sets, you know, and do a lot of different things. These people are really prolific and don't be bogged down in like one project. So that's all you're doing. So definitely just diversify. And thanks again. Nice.